Imagine you play the spot at 10 and L and you check here. Oh my god, you oh, and you wonder why you don't win. If you check here and you're sitting there like, oh, I'm so unlucky. No, you're not unlucky. You're just playing really badly. Like, this is a spot where if you're playing this against an average reg at 10 and L, like, you are getting 70% fold equity by leading this turn. Indifference. What is indifference? Indifference is not caring what you do in a certain situation. Indifference is like when you go to McDonald's and the guy's like, do you want this Big Mac or this Big Mac? And you're like, I don't care, man. Just give me a Big Mac. Like, they're all the same. They're all generic. Slightly more gherkins on one. That's probably good. Depending on your affiliation with gherkins. Pickles, for you Americans. These are indifferent choices. Another place where indifference is rife is the solver. In the solver, have you ever noticed that you're indifferent in loads of spots, not every spot. Of course, it's still better to bluff the river when you have a massive range advantage and no showdown value than it is to check, and it's still better to value better the nuts in position than to check, and it's good to fold nothing on the flop to a pot size C bet. But there are many spots where you are indifferent in a solver, in theory. It's much, much, much harder to lose EV, theoretically speaking, than it is in the real world. In other words, when it comes to being indifferent in reality, you're almost never indifferent because your opponents aren't playing in this very deliberate, constructed, contrived way that seeks to maximize indifference. And not only that, but is infinitely able to achieve that goal. Realistically, what you do matters. And every time you're in a spot, as we talked about in the last video in this series, Cash Game Mastery, you have to try and decipher whether one line is better than the other and, you know, to what extent. And think about the game, think about your decisions, don't autopilot. Today, I'm going to show you yet more spots from a morning 200 zoom session from PokerStars, and I'm going to aim to illustrate just how much it matters in certain spots, and I'm going to try to get rid of this horrible tendency people have these days to mix. To be like, I don't know, so I'll just usually do this, but sometimes do this, or I'll do this half the time. And while that can be okay in like really mundane spots like preflop, you know, you've got 9-8 suited in the big blind against a button open, it really doesn't matter what you do there usually although it could against different stack sizes and player types, it could matter a lot. But what I'm seeing more and more these days is people just lazily doing something because they saw it somewhere. Their coach did it once, their solver did it once. And we need to stop this. We need to start learning that we're not indifferent. And we need to start going back to the age-old principle of figuring out what's better. So I'm going to do that today with you. Let's get into some spots now and let's enjoy this. Let's enjoy being able to really think freely again. So here's a hand to start us off where we're really not indifferent. We have the choice to either call or 3-bet here with 9-8 suited in the big blind. And here we are indifferent actually for this one street, or at least we're close enough to indifferent that I don't know what to do. Villain is a fairly strong reg, and in reality, here's the thing, like probably it's either slightly better to 3-bet or it's slightly better to call, but I don't know which, because in theory it's indifferent. So here is a rare spot where I'm willing to defer to the RNG, and I'm willing to say, okay, I'll just 3-bet sometimes, I'll keep my frequencies in check, I'll usually just call... I'll do what my solver tells me to do here, which is fine. But now that we get post-flop and we get a really extreme board texture and villain checks, you already need to ask, what are the chances that we are indifferent between betting and checking? Okay, the solver isn't even indifferent here, it will always bet. But if we didn't have the nuts, if we had some other hand like 10-9, for example, 10-9 of spades, change the 8 to the 10, what are the chances we're indifferent between bet and check? In other words, what are the chances that my garden outside and your garden, if you have one, maybe you live in an apartment or flat and you don't, but let's just, just humour me. What are the chances that our respective gardens contain the same number of daisies? How big? Write down a number. Write it in the comments. What are the chances? Practically zero. Imagine your garden and mine both had 311 daisies. That'd be pretty messed up coincidence. It's a bit like that here. Just because the solver says with 10-9 of spades, bet and check are the same, that's because the small blind has psychopathically gone out of their way to construct exactly the strategy that means you can't gain EV by choosing one of those options. It's Nash Equilibrium. And Rock, Paper, Scissors, it's exactly 33.3333% frequency for every action. Can't do that in poker, not even on the flop, it's too difficult. So actually one line is better than the other here. And our job is to figure out which. You are not indifferent. With 9-8, the solver agrees that we're not indifferent, but it thinks that check is closer to bet than it actually is in terms of EV. So I think your solvers will always bet here. And I'm going to use large bets on this flop. I think that's great. A great strategy here for many reasons. Mainly massive nut advantage us, which is unusual as a preflop caller, but this is a very extreme texture. 
And so I'm going to bet big here all the time, but I don't think it's a small gain of EV. I think checking is like really, really quite bad, actually. I think not pot building here in this world against the true reigns that's checking here is bad. So we go for a big bet and against this villain should usually just call on this texture. They shouldn't be playing a lot of rays. So we take a little bit of time, you know, mm, should I bet here? Don't know. Don't want to use 43 seconds of my time bank. No, let's bet. And our opponent doesn't fold because that would make for a really boring first hand. So villain calls. Jack of spades. Okay. Are we indifferent between betting one third pot, betting half pot, betting 75% of the pot? You think about those three sizes, which is better. Could we overbet? Is that better? Well, let's think about it. Our hand is the immortal nuts. The SPR is still fairly low. We're going to get raised practically never, way less than the solver would raise us here when we bet smaller. Therefore, all of those things taken into account, we should just overbet because we have loads more money to bring in. Villain has tons and tons of mergy hands. They're meant to raise smaller bets, sometimes like eights or something, or like seven, eight, or five X of hearts, or weird stuff that they're meant to jam sometimes, and they're not going to. And I also think they're going to station this node a bit because like actually when we overbet here, one pair hands are all really indifferent. Over pairs are even indifferent. A jack is kind of indifferent. I think our opponent is going to probably station those hands more than they should. So I think overbetting is easily the best play. And I don't think it's indifferent at all. I don't think betting 60% pot is okay. And if your solver is like, you can bet 60% pot here or you can overbet. And then you're like, oh yes, the solver said it was fine. So I'm, I'm going to do this. You can have a hard time, my friend. You can have a very, very hard time getting really good at this game because you don't actually understand how to make the right decisions. You have to engage with the real world. You have to hand read. You have to think about your opponent's range and what they're doing with it and how that may differ from your solver. If you've never studied solvers before, all that means is that you probably don't have a great idea of what people should do. But maybe you've still got some idea about what they do. I would definitely recommend studying with solvers. Just don't copy them. You can learn theory without copying GTO. People ask me all the time, Oh Pete, um, do you think I should use GTO at 10 NL? And it's like, what the hell does that question even mean? What on earth are you talking about? Should you like pull up a sim and try and copy it? No. One, that's cheating. Two, it's not even the best way to play against your opponent's real ranges. So GTO to me means the output you look at when you run a sim. There's a hell of a lot in the middle between just doing whatever you feel like exploitatively and only thinking about one thing and then like the GTO output that's like the perfect equilibrium. Actually, the real meat of the issue is in between, and that's what we call poker theory. So understanding that when the SPR is low and you're in position and you have the nuts and villain has tons of mergy, drawy, pair plus drawy hands and over pairs that you should overbet, that's poker theory. That's not GTO, because GTO will often do other things too, because its opponent has gone out of its way to make it indifferent. No one is going out of their way to make you indifferent. Are you that paranoid that you sat there like, oh, they're concocting exactly the right strategy to mean that when I bet this size and this size, it's the same EV. No, no, they're not. And if you can figure out how they're lopsided or crooked or skewed here, you can really gain EV, guys. You can actually beat the games that you're stuck at. Cash Injection's all about that, our course on CarrotCorner.com. It's all about common spots where you want to take exploitative lines to dramatically increase EV. When we overbet here, what we're essentially saying to Villain is we either got a really big hand or we have air. Do you want a bluff catch? And the way to maximize your EV when you have the Immortal Nuts in game theory, not in GTO, GTO is just literally the output for one hand, but the overall theoretical concept here is that when you've got the Immortal Nuts and there's 1.5x pot left and you don't hugely block the calling range, you should jam the 1.5x. The reason for this is that in game theory, you do better by maximizing the magnitude of what you earn when called and not the frequency at which you get called. Big fallacy here where people are like, oh, we don't want to blow him out of the pot. That's going on my Twitter list, guys. I keep coming up with these gems that are awful thought processes that are everywhere. I didn't want to blow you off the hand, man. I wanted to keep you in. I want to make a milking bed, dude. This is so anti-theoretical. This is so bad. Actually, when you are never getting raised because there's no room left to get raised or the opponent just won't raise in a certain spot. So it's just not a thing that people do, humans do. What matters is magnitude. Because put it this way, if I bet one big blind into a pot of 100, I'm meant to get called 99% of the time, but then I make 99% of a big blind. If I bet 4x pot, 
Now I'm not really meant to get called very often. I'm meant to get like 80% fold equity, but then I make four times the pot every time I get called. I make almost the whole pot now instead of one big blind. So clearly betting tiny to maximize how often you get called is very, very bad, theoretically speaking, when you have the nuts and you don't block the calling range heavily and villain isn't raising you a lot. There are exceptions where these things are false. Shove is the only play here, but many of you out there, I know you guys, I actually know how you play. You're sitting there like, you don't fucking know me, Pete. you never spoken to me. But I've taught hundreds, literally hundreds of people that play your stakes and they all think like you. You're not unique. I'm so sorry to inform you that you're not actually that special in your deficiencies as a poker player. You're special in other ways, you know. I'm sure there's amazing things about you. But your poker leaks are not very unique, most likely. Okay, maybe you're that one rare person who has a bizarre leak of, like, always going crazy when the turn is a jack or something bizarre like that. But for most people, the leaks are just uniform, and that's why mass data and our course cash injection is really effective. It takes a broad poker player spectrum and you know, the leaks are just really generic and uniform across them and you can use that somewhat depressing fact to destroy your opponents. We all have human brains, human anatomies, and they all make sense of poker in similar ways. Moreover, we all watch YouTube and Twitch and content from training sites and courses. We all take in the same jargon. We all speak to poker friends that mislead us horribly. So jam is good. Only play, big EB difference here between jam and a smaller bet, but many of you will make a smaller bet, and I know this because I've taught many of you. Not literally, but people just like you. So yeah, don't blunder here. Oh, he folded, by the way. I want to just skip to like the next hand because I don't care what he does. It's not important. If you're like on the edge of your seat here, like, oh my god, please call, please call, please call, please call, please call, please call. Okay, it's good to have passion, but do you think you're maybe a bit too emotionally involved? Do you think that maybe the extent to which you care about the result here may make it hard for you to think clearly in future? Try to bear that in mind and try to remember that this is just one spot and in the long run this fold is disappointing, sure, and it's okay to feel disappointed when your opponent doesn't pay off the overbet. It doesn't mean it's okay to start berating yourself and saying, God damn it, I should have bet smaller. Instantly. I call that ouch I should never have. Ouch I should never have is the thought process of going, bad outcome, therefore I fucked up. Doesn't follow. The shove is good. The better my videos do, the more nonsensical comments I get, guys. This is a fun fact. What you should probably do is look at the comments for a video, and if there are comments that sound brain dead, then the video has done well. This is my new algorithm. So let's hope people are like, you can't shove there and like object, because that means the video is reaching a lot of people. Or six, you can bluff the flop with the back door. I don't know that this is overfolded against a strong player. Against a weak player, I'd bet the flop every single time. Like I said in the last video, you don't wake up in the morning and stab yourself in the face with a fork 4% of the time, because it's bad, so you do it never. So if checking is worse than betting, I'll always bet here against a recreational, but aren't you worried about balance, Pete? No. Balance is one of the stupidest things in the world. Stew on that. So actually, against a good reg, I can bet or not on the flop. I can take it or leave it. This time I leave it. I don't have a clear idea about which line is better. Probably one line is better, but this player is playing close enough to theoretically solidly that I can't tell which. So they've done enough to negate my exploit. On the turn, I don't think I can bet there. I think the world is too unfavorable and position is not quite redeeming enough. I block a lot of folds. On the river, I also block a lot of folds. You can bluff sometimes with this hand, I think. I think so. Although blocking sixes and fours and a six would bluff by now. Blocking under pairs isn't great here. I'd also want to have spades. I think my main bluffs here are spades because they unblock more like trashy our hands like a six of diamonds that gets here. But I don't even know if Villain ever gets here. I think this is just indifferent in theory. In practice, I want to say this is over defended by this player type and I should give up. And I actually bet here. Against a weaker player, this is good. But against a good reg, I think the good reg population over defends this node. And I should give up that hand. Because again, what are the chances I am indifferent? You are not indifferent. That's the whole slogan of today's video. So yeah, lots of cool spots coming up here that are just kind of run of the mill. But they're, they're super important. And they show you how rarely you're indifferent. Here's another one where I don't think you're indifferent at all. Solver may say you're indifferent here. It may say it's close. Defending big blind against cutoff. Good reg again. Check flop, they check back. Turn is a 9. This is a spot where I would use B75. Few reasons for this. One, my opponent's checking back a lot of overpair on this texture in game theory. So they're not super capped here. I don't want to overbet this node. They can even have a 5, believe it or not, in game theory if they're good. And that's a weird thing about paired boards. I'm not getting to that today. If I ever say we're not getting into that today and you're like, God damn it, Pete, get into it. Go to carrotcorner.com. The carrot poker school gets into everything there is to say about the theory of the game. Everything. It's completely comprehensive. 33 hours long. Carrot Poker School, carrotcorner.com, that's what you need. 
This is about giving you guys an insight into proper poker education. It's not the full deal. Don't think because you watch my YouTube channel you're going to be a complete crusher. It may take a bit more of a systematic approach, but this will help. So Queen7 is a hand that does pretty well in this spot, has a lot of pot share EV. Part of that is because it has some equity. The other part of that is that this is quite a favourable world for the big blinds range, where the middling connected vicinity of the cards out there very much makes it the case that our range is, is doing well. So if you bet your fold equity is at a bit of a premium, you're getting more than you need and you're generating a lot of EV. You're generating some EV by check raising or check calling here too. Check raising seems somewhat thin. I'm not sure you can do it. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. It's close. Check call you can't do. Therefore, bet could just be the front runner in theory. It could be the best line in theory if check raise isn't so viable because you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you check fold this much equity when your range is doing this well. It's okay to check fold some equity when your range is getting slaughtered, but when your range is doing well, it's not really so defensible. So with Queen7, I definitely think we should bet, and it may be the front runner play in theory, but in practice, it's definitely the best play, and here's why. If we bet three quarters pot here, on average, it's going to be tough for our opponent to make enough defense. And I don't think they're going to suddenly raise us or apply aggression later enough either. So I do believe that the EV of this hand goes up a little bit against humans, even against good players, but especially against bad players. If you play the spot at 10 NL, my god is the fold equity like absurdly high. Imagine you play the spot at 10 NL and you check here, oh my god, oh, you wonder why you don't win. If you check here and you're sitting there like, oh, I'm so unlucky. No, you're not unlucky, you're just playing really badly. Like, this is a spot where if you're playing this against an average reg at 10 NL, like, you're getting 70% fold equity by leading this turn, and yet you're checking and facing a frequent delayed C bet and then folding. The difference between check folding and betting here at 10 NL is so large that it's like waking up in the morning and drinking a coffee, and waking up in the morning and drinking washing up liquid. That's the difference. It's that big. I know which one I would prefer, but I'm a washing up liquid fan. Just kidding. You need to choose the coffee here. It's important. This spot, blind versus blind, king 10-8, you have 10-8. You're indifferent in theory between bet and check. Surprise, surprise, theory has, in its Machiavellian, pathological ways, concocted a world where no matter what you do, you have the same EV. You should be suspicious of that as a human. You should be like, really? The EV is the same? Hmm, I doubt it. So what's better? Well, I don't know. <laughs> it's close, it's hard to say. If Ellen's a decent player, it's hard to say. But I do know that if they're not a decent player, check is better, because they're going to bet too often I can get this juicy, juicy check raise in. So with any ambiguity about who villain is, I would check here. If they're passive, I bet. They're aggro, I check. They're unknown, it's close. It's one of these ones. Now on the turn, the solver's going to be like, well, you can check here because they're going to stab a lot and, and you can check raise all in. And in reality, people get freaked here. Like you've check raised them big when they see bet flop big. They're going to check back a ton. They're not going to reopen action as much as the solver is here in this particular spot. So you must bet. It's not actually indifferent. You must bet here. Again, you are not indifferent. Have I made the message of this video clear? On the river, I do something really bizarre. And it's something that if this video does well, and it attracts non-poker thinkers who think they're great at the game, then I'm going to incur the wrath of that community. They're going to be like, Oh, you didn't value bet the river, you're atrocious. And maybe they're right that I should value bet the river, but here's my argument for checking. Villain's range is basically going to be 10x, which I think will actually value bet sometimes if we check, even though it probably shouldn't be so pulled here. King X, more so King X than 10x. King X will not always big bet flop, sometimes it'll bet smaller or check. And then a shit ton of busted draw. So if I jam the river in theory, he's probably meant to call ace queen of spades. Not ace queen of spades, doesn't have that, but let's say ace jack, ace nine of spades, something like that. Why? Because he beats bluffs and he unblocks bluffs as well, because I don't bluff with ace of spades. Maybe that's true, maybe it's false, but he's meant to have a lot of hands like that. So there's a ton of draw here. Queen jack is super abundant, it's like 16 combos pre. Some of it gets 3 bet, but most of it remains on this node. And it's very likely to big bet, call and call turn. 9-7 is very, very likely to big bet, call and call turn. Jack-9 is very likely to big bet, call and call turn. Jack-9 off doesn't 3 bet enough pre because people suck. It should 3 bet it pre as a bluff, they don't very often. The villain's range is actually drowning in misdraws in this spot to such an extent that when I block the 10 and I block King-8, I really feel like check is better. Usually when you pull out massively like this by check raising and barreling turn, you just keep going on the river. And if the board was drier, it's a huge catastrophe to check. The reason check is going to work here is the villain's range is disproportionately shifted towards nothing, and so letting them bluff is really cool. Okay, sometimes I run into like the king deuce or something, 
the randomly big bet flop, but that's not always calling river anyway. Villain did have a king here, which really sucks, but I think overall the check is really reasonable. I think they're going to bluff their miss draws there on mass. I don't think they're going to call with a king on mass, so it's interesting. Here's another spot, and this is a preview. I'm going to give you a bit of cash injection for free, just a little bit of this course for free right now. When you face lazy range bet strategies, this board is not a range bet board. King 7, 5, 2, 2, in theory is bet probably 60, 55, 50% of the time for small sizing, something like that. Humans bet everything. And then when they look at a sim, because nobody takes the effort to build their own good sims anymore in Pile Solver, kids these days on their GTO wizard. They go to GTO wizard and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, let's look at this. Yeah. Problem with that is that GTO wizard didn't bet all of its range, but you did, and you're not even looking at the same sim. And they see a defense frequency, and they learn what they should call and what they shouldn't, but they don't realize that they're range betting, and I know they're probably range betting, and I'm playing in such a way that assumes they're range betting, and I'm playing in an even more cash injection inspired, mass data inspired, exploitative way where I'm actually raising way more as a bluff than it says, and then they're folding, and I'm taking candy from a baby in this spot, and you can do the same in 10 spots by going over to carrotcorner.com and getting cash injection. It's not even £100. It's our cheapest course that's out on video, and it's basically a recipe to just getting extra win rate quickly. That is the idea. Here's another one. This one, we've gone for 3 bet pre. We go 12 big blinds. Same guy we just played against decides to call this time. This is a 3 bet bluff. It's a mix. You can call, you can 3 bet. If you don't see this as a 3 bet option, you need to go and study some pre flop and understand that it could be. I guarantee that for 90% of you watching this, you don't bluff enough out of the big blind pre flop with 3 betting. You're playing like fish, basically. Sorry. You're playing like tight fish out of the big blind. I know this because I know the mass data. I've got all the data on you guys. I'm seeing into your soul. I'm not just making this up. You don't 3 bet enough. You don't. You watching this, you right there. I mean, people are angry right now. If you're angry right now, you're probably like pretty screwed in poker, to be honest. You need to do a lot of mental game work. If you're like quite happy about this and you're like, oh wow, this is insightful, then probably you're gonna get there one day. And if you're like, okay, Pete, you're being a bit of a dick and I don't really like you, but I take your point, then you're probably also gonna get there one day and that's okay. You're allowed to not like me. So I went for the big bet. And the reason I went for the big bet is that I think this is a misunderstood spot. So in single raise pots on paired boards like this, you don't big bet because the idea is your opponent's either going to have a queen or something pretty bad. Usually, okay, there's some of Margie hands 4x, 6s clubs, but most of their range is like queen x or nothing. Okay, a lot of it is, not most. In the 3-bet pot, they have less queen x because they don't have as many offsuit queens. Like They have king queen off, ace queen off, I block some ace queen off. They have some suited queens as well, but it's not like they just have like queen 7 suited like they have or queen 9 off like they have in a single raise pot. What you can do is you can say, well, I have more overpair, and overpair are actually good enough to big bet here and play big pots with. So I decide to bet big. But the real exploitative reason, the theory nonsense aside, the real exploitative reason why I decide to big bet here is it's really hard to deal with. People aren't used to facing it, and if I can put a cat amongst the pigeons, I always want to do that. Like, think about you, right, in this spot. What are you used to? What's your comfort zone? I'm going to venture that your comfort zone is facing a small bet here. And when you're butted on this flop and you face a small bet, you're like, okay, I've kind of studied this. I've got some idea what to do, some raises, some calls. If you never raise this spot, you probably should, by the way, a lot. But against big bet, you're likely to freak out a bit. You're likely to be like, okay, I don't really know like what's going on here. And I have ace jack of diamonds and I like the hand, but I can't call the sizing. Actually, you can. I know I block ace jack of diamonds, guys. Please don't be so literal. If you're that literal, you're never going to make it poker. You've got you got to think outside the box a little bit. I like to threaten you guys with that. If you do something that annoys me, you won't make it. You're screwed. It's fun. So yeah, the overarching point here is that, again, when two plays look really close, like clearly small bets and big bets and checks are all close here. I think bet's a bit better than check here, actually. I won't go into that. But the reason I choose big bet over small bet is not that big bet you have to do it. It's theoretically the only option. That's never the case in a board like this in a three bet pot. The reason I do it is it's unfamiliarity theorem. I'm taking villain, leading him into the dark room, and I'm saying find the way out. And if he's not seen the dark room before, and he's not got a torch, and he's kind of like not very good at using his hands to like feel where everything is in the room, he's going to like spend a while trying to get out of that room. If I turn the light on, and he's seen it all before, and he's in his own house, he can get out easily. I need to make life more difficult for them by picking a line that, well, I don't really have any anything else to think about. If they fold, that's the end. I've just maybe exploited them. And if they call, we'll both be in the dark a little bit on the turn. That's fine. I trust myself to figure it out more than they do because I autopilot a lot less than they do. That's my feeling. So to conclude this, you are not indifferent lesson. Sometimes you're not indifferent because one play is way better than the other. Sometimes it's closer. 
but one play is likely to open up more lines where a villain makes mistakes, and in that case you should probably take that play, but not at the expense of obvious EB. Oh, why did you barrel second pair on the turn for an overbet? Oh, I wanted to make it hard for him. I wanted to put him in a tough spot. Yeah, so you just butchered poker. You basically just like let poker on fire in the process. You burned it. Don't do that. But yeah, when you actually are not sure and you think EV is quite close and there's no obvious reason why one play is better than the other, that, my friends, is where you should be thinking, how do I lead this person out of their comfort zone? How do I play a strategy that's likely to elicit more mistakes? I'll leave you with that thought. And if you like the content, do subscribe, do comment, do like it. And also go to carrotcorner.com for organized, paid, comprehensive courses. If you like this, you're going to love those. I'll see you in the next YouTube video. Bye for now, guys.